I, I think that someone took her very quietly and mm-hmm. took her down the basement. Mm-hmm. And then maybe took a knife out. And then, you know, or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Or, you think that's how she died? Or maybe a hammer mm-hmm. in the head. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. In the opening clip where Burke Ramsey talks to Dr. Susan Bernhard, I've always found it interesting that he presented two options or two alternatives for how John Bonet died. He referred to a knife and he also referred to a hammer. Burke was right about two aspects there. He was right that there were two um, aspects to John Bonet's murder. And he was also right that there was a very hard impact to John Bonet's head. And I think uh, Detective Steve Thomas or somebody made a big deal about the fact that, um, you know, how could Burke have known this um, as early as the 8th of January um, because it wasn't really in the media well it was it was in the media briefly Um, it it wasn't very well known but there was at least one article about it but in any event there was a detective that um, wondered how Burke would have known this in this episode we're not going to be talking about Burke or hammers or knives Instead, we'll be limiting our inquiry to just the torch. And we're going to be asking two questions. And pay attention to these two questions. The first question is, was the torch the murder weapon? And the second question is, was the torch used on the skull? And they're different questions. We will be spending other episodes dealing with uh, the question as well and um, it will also be some of the even deeper analysis will be dealt with on Patreon. Uh, You can head over to Patreon for um, some analysis on what I call Burke Ramsey's Sodagate as well as much deeper discussion and analysis on this topic. So if you're not a member of Patreon already, head over to Patreon slash TCRS. And then over the next couple of days on this channel, there will be some analysis on the events that played out 23 years ago today in the John Bonet Ramsey case. If you're interested in staying up to date with those episodes and other coverage, please subscribe to this channel, uh, ring the bell, like, share, leave a comment and let's get started so there's a kind of a double layer to the Ramsey case and what I mean by that is um, what happened to John Bonet wasn't one thing she wasn't just um, hit on the head and it wasn't just a hit on the head it was a huge blow to the head it was like a bludgeoning right and at the same time there was like no evidence of that there was no you would imagine after a massive blow on the head like that that cracked her skull that there would be a lot of blood and there wasn't right but at the same time there couldn't have been no blood at all right so you have these sort of double areas Um, there's also the garrote and so in terms of that you kind of have a double execution You've, you've got John Bonet being hit over the head in a very severe way, but also her throat uh, garroted, also in a very severe way. And, and there have been a couple of episodes and descriptions of overkill, that, that this whole crime was overkill. And then the third dimension to all this is the sexual contact, I, I wouldn't even call it sexual assault, which some people say there wasn't any, and some people say it was the work of a violent paedophile. And so you have the two layers there as well. In terms of my expertise in talking about this case, um, I've written a trilogy of books uh, 
called The Craven Silence and I've written another trilogy of books The Day After Christmas and so that is the expertise I bring into the narrative when for example in the CBS um, docu-series The Case of John Benet Ramsey what is agreed upon by all the experts sitting around that table that the cause of death was brain injury or um, murder um, to, as a result of the impact to the brain by a blunt object and so in my opinion that is wrong uh, in my opinion that's not the cause of death and in this episode we will look at the actual autopsy in some detail in terms of Dr. Lee where he says that you know something similar in shape to the flashlight may have been used you know to to hit John Bernal on the head um, that part is more accurate not completely accurate but more accurate and by the end of this episode I will deal with that in more detail and Dr. Lee in more detail so as I've said um, there are other objects that one can talk about as well um, but we're not going to do that in this episode otherwise it'll be a really long episode all we're going to talk about is the torch and we're going to um, pretend that, that, that all that, that's all there is to talk about that's not the case but that is what we're going to do in this episode so as late as 2001 which was you know effectively four years after the crime you, you kind of still had a intense debate between two sort of detectives and um, you know on the one side and, and a lot of this was around the head wound um, so on the one side you had um, detective St uh, Steve Thomas saying that John Bernard suffered that head wound by um, John Bernard accidentally being struck on her head um, you know something like that she'd fallen and hit her head on the, uh, uh, the edge of a bathtub with, you know that someone had pushed her and she'd sort of stepped back and fallen and, and banged her head really hard on the back of a bathtub so that was the one scenario you know that the edge of it the bathtub caused that injury um, and then Lou Smith sort of provided a counter to that where he said John Bernay was strangled first and then struck on the head and, th and so that led to additional um, sort of argument you know was she strangled first then struck on the head or was she strangled first um, you know w which way was it w you know if you think I'm being cheeky or arrogant or I'm misinformed or ignorant um, the coroner in this case uh, Dr. Mayer listed the official cause of death as strangulation associated with head trauma and we're going to look at the autopsy but this is a aspect that I'm a little bit troubled with is that you have these experts gathered around the table and they sort of convinced that they're unanimous that the cause of death is head trauma and it's not what the autopsy shows now I'm not saying that the autopsy trumps all but what I am saying is you can't simply dismiss what the um, coroner says and, and the reason is the coroner dealt with the actual body on the slab that the coroner saw the wounds himself the coroner you know dealt with the actual um, cadaver and the human remains and so for somebody else to come afterwards and say no I'll, uh, in my opinion I don't think this was that bad or I don't think this or that you've got to be very careful with that on the other hand um, coroners aren't foolproof um, it's not an exact science sometimes it is but it's not an exact science and uh, you know a good example of where a coroner I believe did get it wrong is the Rebecca Zahau case where he said the coroner said that he believed the um, uh, death was caused by um, ligature strangulation and I don't think that's the case I think it was caused by manual strangulation so I'm not someone who reads the letter of a coroner's report as gospel 
if it makes sense, it makes sense. Um, in terms of the Zahal thing, it doesn't make sense. In terms of the John Bonet um, case, it does make sense. So that's that's really where that comes from. The point that I want to stress is, you have these experts like um, you know Cyril Wecht and Dr. Henry Lee and all these FBI people, who absolutely unanimous that that this is how John Bonet was killed. And uh, all I'm saying is the coroner's report disagrees with that, and I'm also saying I disagree with that. And Lou Smith. <laughs> also disagrees with that. I don't really uh, generally agree with Lou Smith, but I do agree with him on this particular point. The the head wound and the injuries and, and you know the blood around the, the brain uh, shouldn't be seen in isolation. We, we need to bear in mind that a garrote was used, but for the sake of this argument and for the sake of this episode, we're not going to go into that area. We don't want to talk about the garage, we don't want to talk about the knots, we don't want to talk about any of that stuff. All we really want to ask is, number one, was John Bonet killed because of a blow to her head uh, with a torch? And number two, was John Bonet hit on the head with a torch? Now, another coroner, Mike Dobison from Adams County, uh, reviewed the autopsy photograph so he also didn't he wasn't at the autopsy but he said that um, you know there would have been a lot more internal bleeding inside the brain if John Bernard had been struck first on the head and strangled later so basically what Dobison is saying is that he supports the coroner um, Mayer Mayer's contention that it, it was death by strangulation that that was actually what what caused her death. And then just a final point I want to highlight before we deal with the torch is that two tablespoons of blood were um, caused by the injury, which is not a lot. So basically you had a massive blow to the head which cracked the skull and there was very little bleeding. There was cracking of the skull but not breaking of the skin. And and in that lies a very, very, very important clue. So let's get started on the on the torch. Um, there are a couple of things I want to say about it. I think the first aspect to mention is that no evidence was found on it. So there was no um, DNA or fibers or fingerprints or anything on the on the torch. Incidentally you had kind of the same thing with the ransom note. You had no DNA, fibers and you had one fingerprint belonging to a fingerprint technician and that's it. There weren't any fingerprints of the police, there weren't any fingerprints of the Ramses. And so in a weird way you kind of have the same scenario of the torch and the ransom note. Both sort of in plain sight, the ransom note on the, s on the stairs and the torch on the um, on the kitchen counter, and so the torch on the kitchen counter is is almost like a big sign saying "me, me, me." Um, you know, I'm the murder weapon. Here I am, right? Just as the ransom note on the stairs is saying "me, me, me." Look at me. Here I am. Um, intruder alert, etc., etc. And I think this is a aspect in terms of the psychology of this case that. A lot of people are just not sophisticated enough to look at. They see the, the torch there and they think, oh, um, pineapples on the table, pineapple in John Bonet's stomach, torch, murder weapon, case closed, uh, QED, very easily, very easily done. If you believe that scenario and you believe that someone inside the house committed this crime with a torch and then someone else in the house scribbled a ransom note to protect that person in the house and they put the ransom note somewhere where people could find and they hid John Bonet away where someone wouldn't find them then you've got to ask yourself why would you leave the torch in plain sight and you know, why, why would you leave such an obvious clue in the most obvious place because you know the torch on the kitchen counter is standing out it's like 
what's it doing here? And if people noticed the bowl with pineapple, people also noticed the couch. Uh, sorry, the um, the torch. So an obvious question to ask is: Is the pageantry of the ransom note at all reflected in the possible pageantry of the torch? Is the torch pageantry, or is the torch an actual um, thing that is part of this crime? And there are two ways of looking at it. You can say, did an intruder break in with a torch, use the torch, and then leave the torch behind and, and run away? And equally, if the crime was committed in the basement, shouldn't the intruder have had the torch with him in the basement? And shouldn't the intruder have taken the torch with him when he left? Another question you could then say is, well, if it's not an intruder, and the torch is from within the house, which I think I think was established. Um, that can be confirmed, but I'm not going to go into that here. The um, but the aspect with the torch is, um, if the torch was used somewhere by someone, why wouldn't why would you leave it there if you were trying to cover up a crime? And one possible answer to that is the torch wasn't used on John Bonet, but somebody wants you to think it was used, and and uh, a lot of people have fallen for exactly that. Now, something that uh, is a very um, sensible way of dealing with this question is looking at the injury, looking at the skull, looking at the fragment that is missing, and looking at the dimensions of the torch and seeing if they match together and the answer is um, roughly but 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 quite closely there is a match and so this is quite important and then this takes us to the autopsy report and as autopsy reports go this one's fairly complicated certainly a lot more complicated than uh, the Watts case uh, but it refers to um, a skull uh, uh, extensive skull fracture and it specifically refers to the rectangular shaped displaced fragment of skull that is measured as three quarters by uh, one half inch. So that sort of gives us the dimensions of this kind of rectangle and we can see that when you put the torch onto the skull you kind of get a similar kind of rectangle right you've got a circular object on a circular object but the area that basically impacts is um, kind of roughly a, a rectangle and then when you sort of go a little bit further into the autopsy report um, what's quite interesting is that just talks about um, when they removed the skull cap they found a thin film of subdural hemorrhage measuring about 7 to 8 cc's uh, over the surface of the right cerebral hemisphere so wh what that's really saying is there was a small amount of bleeding as a result of this injury um, covering the um, the right cerebral hemisphere. So, so the left cerebral hemisphere, the left side of John Bonnet's brain was basically normal. The other side kind of had a form, uh, a very thin form of blood that had um, sort of oozed um, over the skull cap. But basically it was just very little bleeding and there was certainly no perforation of the um, brain sac to the, to the extent that the hair wasn't um, discolored and you know there was no blood on the head on the scalp and what's interesting in this respect is um, that some people doctors and surgeons and so on have said that's not uncommon people can come into you know emergency wards with broken bones but th the skin above the bone isn't always broken or cut um, skin is elastic um, bone is less elastic and when we think of properties like that, when we think of the the how the property of skin, even if it's on top of the surface that is broken, 
you know, in this case, the, the skull, and it can still stay intact, then we also need to think of the, the properties and the elasticity of the object hitting the skull. Now, you may recall in the previous episode, we spoke about the sort of semi-absurd contention that Santa Claus had abducted John Bonnet. And the part that was kind of interesting that came out of this was who fed John Bonnet pineapple? You know, who sort of, who would have led her downstairs? You know, she's asleep in bed and she somehow gets led downstairs. She somehow ends up downstairs eating pineapple. How did that happen? I don't believe that she was sleeping, but um, nevertheless, it sort of raises this question of, so did Sant was Santa Claus strong enough to cause this, this injury? And by the same token, one can say, you know, was a small boy strong enough to inflict the same kind of injury? And that's a very um, important question that sort of arises. Is you, s you look at this torch and you say, how hard would someone need to hit someone over the head with, with this torch in order to inflict a severe um, head injury like that? And the answer is very, very hard. Um, harder than torches are meant to be hit and one aspect that I would like to see is you know if you do hit someone on the head with a torch like that would it work afterwards and and then look at the torch on the kitchen counter did that torch work because there's some sensitive elements on a torch n none less so than the, the the light bulb inside and that's quite easy to damage and so was that damaged and so this brings us to something that was mentioned in the CBS show. It, it was uh, testing this particular uh, idea and basically um, t testing um, Patsy's own point and John's point in The Death of Innocence uh, where they said, you know, the tremendous blow to John Bonnet's head would have required the strength of a man. And CBS then took that point and uh, demonstrated it in their show and some aspects of the demonstration were quite good uh, not all of them for example I don't believe John Bonet was standing when she was hit um, so the whole thing of measuring John Bonet's height and then having someone standing and and you know standing right beside John Bonet like you know she's standing um, I don't think she was in a standing position when this happened and that also kind of showed to me that the people who came up with this scenario really hadn't thought it through. It was really, really simplistic. It was based on John Bonnet takes a piece of pineapple and, and someone else uh, bludgeons her to death there and then, like on the spot. And there just happens to be a, a torch um, at the ready, you know, when, when he needs to do that. And then there's no explanation for then what happened after that with the sexual contact and also the um, the garroting. Um, I, I think what they would have said is that the garroting was completely staged after the fact. Well you would have to say that. You'd have to say then that the cause of death is due to a blunt force trauma to the brain but that's not what the autopsy shows. Of course if that's your scenario that that you know that that is a scenario I just don't think it's true. And this brings us to Dr. Henry Lee. Um, Dr. Henry Lee is quite respected in various areas and so on. Um, he's had his highlights and then he's had a couple of lowlights. Um, one of the lowlights is where he was sort of part of the team that said that the cadaver odor in uh, Casey Anthony's um, trunk was the smell of pizza and it wasn't a cadaver. Uh, Dr. Henry Lee uh, didn't uh, testify in the Casey Anthony case, but um, I, I seem to be remember him saying on television that you know that the smell didn't so smell to him like cadaver odor, which is pretty incredible. So Dr. Henry Lee, um, you know, who appeared in the case of John Bernay Ramsey, uh, he was actually hired by the district attorney Alex Hunter for that case but he appeared to sort of be in consensus with the cast of 
um, you know, the case of John Bernard Ramsey. In the case of Kaylee Anthony, he appeared kind of as a defense expert, basically making to me the absurd case that, um, you know, the human remains in the trunk of the car weren't human remains, you know, that they were whatever else, um, you know, pizza, whatever, you know, garbage, and that the smell of that and human remains are sort of interchangeable when they're not. Um, I'm not going to go into that just because it's a different area, but I'm just saying um, that's an area where I have a very strong difference of opinion with Dr. Lee. But where I do kind of agree with him is where he says that the um, injury to John Bonet's skull was caused by a blunt object and by blunt force, and um, but not necessarily by the flash flashlight. And somewhere in that he says, he's not saying it's not the flashlight, but that something of a similar width could have also caused that. Um, I, I agree with that, and I actually would take it a bit further just to say that you know, it's the true crime rocket science version that the torch wasn't used. Um, it's very pop, uh, a very popular, um, very popularly believed that it was used. I think it's the um, first choice of Kola. I'm not quite sure whether Lou Smith believes it, um, but certainly it's a very popular, almost mainstream belief that that the torch was used. Um, I don't believe it was used. Um, and um, and also I don't believe that the uh, weapon that was used on the skull is the murder weapon. So um, so I think that that needs to be made very very clear. Um, so first of all, so to answer the question, was the um, torch that was used to bash John Bernays skull the murder weapon? Answer no. And then question two, was the torch used to bash John Bonet's skull? Answer, no, right? And so um, I'm going to be dealing with this, uh, the actual murder weapon. Um, and it's not, um, it's not what happened to John Bonet's head or her brain uh, that, that we're going to be looking at. But uh, we still need to answer the question, what was used and based on what evidence? And to just give you a little bit of a peek into that answer, it's not the golf clubs either. And the reason is it's blunt force trauma, but with an object that would have caused that kind of the dimensions of that fragment. That's very, very important. And what's kind of, and this is a clue, what's kind of idiosyncratic about that, that fragment is it's a round object of the, the sort of width of the, the front nose of that torch. And so your, your question, or well the question you've got to answer is, what other object could create that kind of impression, rectangular, that was a similar kind of object to the torch, but not the torch? And uh, I will deal with that in John Bernard Ramsey, The Murder Weapon Revealed um, on Patreon, as well as um, just looking at the, um, just this discussion on why it's been so difficult for people, not just um, the armchair detectives, but actual detectives to agree on things in terms of this case. Why has it been so difficult for experts to figure this case out? And I'm going to be uh, analyzing that in some detail in um, uh, an episode on Patreon. Um, it's a very important question to ask. You know, you say, well, is the John Bonnet Ramsey case that complicated? Is it that difficult? Why is it that it's defeated so many people? You know, people have written books with completely different um, opinions. Why is that? What is going on? Why is this case um, so hard for some people to understand? And that's what I'm going to be um, going into in terms of that. Bear in mind, this is with a background of writ having written two trilogies about it. And, um, and so, so I've certainly thought about this case um, more than most. Uh, if you're not a member of Patreon, uh, please um, head on over there. It's Patreon slash TCRS. Uh, 
Uh, if you'd like more analysis on this channel, uh, there's quite a bit more to come on John Benet Ramsey. Please subscribe, ring the bell to receive notifications, uh, like, share through your your um, true crime networks, um, Twitter, Facebook, and and so on. You can even WhatsApp, um, uh, you know, link to this video to people who might be interested. Um, it's quite important. I'm trying to grow the channel. Um, otherwise, uh, I've got a a brand new book coming out on the case. Uh, it's about twenty-five thousand words. Uh, coming quite soon called Christmas Star um, but uh, in the meantime uh, thank you for listening and I'll see you guys um, tomorrow